how are you? I'm all right. I'm all right. Thanks for uh, coming on my podcast. Oh no, I'm glad. I'm glad to. This is this is nice. I got my dogs outside, so hopefully they'll they won't be barking at the neighbors too much. I started this over the pandemic because I just you know I'm I'm so used to going to film festivals or art gallery openings or right. whatever to and talking about people people's process and uh after a year of not being able to do that i'm just like oh you got to figure something out and so i started right. this podcast last fall that's uh, great yeah, yeah that's great i mean we all we all got to do something to sort of keep ourselves sane at this point right exactly yeah, <laughs> yeah. but um yeah it's it, it's kind of it's kind of taken off in a weird way where like i'm getting more yeses than i expected when i reach out to people uh-huh. so, <laughs> yeah so that's great that's great yeah um, yeah, if you need, if you need to talk to any, any other people, I can try to think up some people. If you ever need anyone, I could see, uh, what, what all are you interested in writers or just all kinds of different creative people, right? Yeah. All kinds of different creative people. Um, anybody who loves to talk about their process. I'm also talking, I just reached out to a physicist, um, <laughs> as I love, uh, science, um, Yeah, and just like. Uh, actually, two weeks ago, I had a guy on. He started an agritech firm. So where like he's created his company's created a uh, a device to allow you to grow vegetables like in a bag. So oh, like wow. so you kind of have like a mobile farm. Yeah. And they're like applying for pat for like uh, programs with like NASA and whatnot. And so I'm like, all right. I had him on for like 20 minutes just to give me a 101 about like all that. <laughs> that's fantastic. Oh, that's exciting, huh? Yeah. Yeah, especially now where where we we need to be thinking about, you know, all sorts of alternatives <laughs> to the conventional system. Like so much seems sort of fraught right now. That's fantastic. My mm. my daughter uh just uh enters she's 9. Uh in her school they had a sci- like a STEM sort of situation and she and her friends came to get, came up with a floating a boat that has a garden on it it sort of like sustains if you were boat bound for the next you know a couple of years how you would be able to grow and and, repro- and uh, recycle water and everything um but that's what kids are thinking about now you know yeah that's where we are it's good yeah and um yeah i mean that's basically yeah i'm interested in everything and everyone yeah as long as they're great. good people oh that's great, <laughs> great. yeah so, i uh I, I thought of you because there was this there was a story I wrote. Um, I basically started writing it in class when uh-huh. I had your craft class. Yeah, and it it literally has scenes of so it's about growing up, and I portray growing up as sort of a um, a soul slicing endeavor on part of the adults. So. <laughs> Every year, pieces of, a, of the main character's soul get sliced off and tossed. Once he's out of his soul, he's just a shell of who he was. Right. He's ready for the workforce. And uh, the, the twist, though, is there's this dog that he grows up with who says, well, you know, I could just take these and save them for you. And then once they think you're an adult, we'll just go off. I'll give them back to you and we can live our lives. Screw these guys. Yeah. Um, of this. course, things don't transpire that way, but this is right. just the idea of a dog being able to save the soul of a human. I love that idea. And then I don't know how, I don't remember what you were talking about that seeded that specific idea, but I do remember leaving class maybe a month into the program, to the craft class, and right. getting in my car. I was flying up to Putnam County. Um, and it just hit me. I'm like, fuck, I think I know. I think I have this story. Like, ah. I don't I don't remember what came first, but I remember going home. Usually I, I would just go to this house I was staying at in the woods and I would just go straight to bed because I, I, I remember like after your class, the next morning I had to wake up and go to Jake's class. Yeah. So I had to workshop with Jake. Yeah. And... I didn't. I stayed up till like two writing the first draft. Wow. So there was something seeded. It's never happened again. Like Ah. you see, you just like, you planted something in my brain that just, and I'm not kidding. Like that whole spring after, because that was a fall semester. The spring semester, 
I, I told um, the person in my workshop, when we go to our meetings, I'd like you to just kind of help me revise the story over again, again and again and again until the end of the term. That way, um, as I've never focused on a short piece for long enough right. for it to actually be worth anything. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I just, I just wanted to make my workshop about this one piece. Right. And so by the end of the term, I had something that I was submitting to places, um, and it ended up getting published about a year after that. That's fantastic. Yeah, it was an interesting ride. Well, it you know what's funny? With you. Yeah, but you're, you're talking about a story that I, that, that idea of, that idea is absolutely like, I could totally see that somehow being in our, our orbit sort of coming together over that kind of an idea because uh, I I feel very strongly about what animals give us that, that nothing else can, you know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, they represent vulnerability. They represent human vulnerability, which is why people are so desperate to protect their pets. I mean, assuming that people have a soul, right? Uh uh, because we're actually, in a sense, transferring our own sense of vulnerability onto this. It's displaced onto this pet, this dog, usually, let's say. Um, and so that 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 feeling of deep love that we have for a dog, for instance, um, is in fact sometimes our only access point to this part of ourselves that uh, that that we can get at, you know. Um, which is not to take away from the sheer joy of just having a dog, uh, because they're just wonderful anyway. But I, but what you're saying is getting at sort of a, a really visceral level of what what that relationship uh, can be about. You know, I love that. That's a great that's a great uh, premise. Yeah, and I was also thinking too. I, I probably told you this in an email or something. I vaguely remember. I, I always thought that your craft class could be the ideal book for a creative person, not just a creative writer, just a creative person. Mm. It's kind of the, I don't know if it's changed since it's been a couple of years, but just this idea of digging deep into the, to the guck of, uh, you know, that nobody wants to really, <laughs> nobody's comfortable initially going into. Right. Um, I don't remember how you worded it. Uh, all my notes have been stored away by this point, but. Right. Right. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I taught it once more and then I've taught a bunch of other ones since. I'm gonna teach it yet another one in the fall that's brand new. I taught a, I'm teaching right now, one I've never taught before. Last semester I taught one on film. So it was cinema, cinema theory as it relates to prose theory. And so we read, uh, we watched a film each week. Uh, everyone, everyone watched a film at home, you know, not in class that would take too much time up from the discussion, yeah. but then I would come at it using like David Bordwell texts or, uh, various, uh, film theory. We even used a, a, a film theory book, this, this Rutledge, uh, which I'm, I'm sort of, I have mixed feelings about it. It's a film theory and introduction through the senses, uh, but it was really amazing because we were doing like the Dardenne brothers and Atticus Lish's preparation for the next life. And so you get this sense of what one realism, like sort of almost, you know, when, you know, when realism can be pushed so far that it starts to turn into an experiment. Yeah. Um, so we're watching the Dardenne brothers <clears throat> for that sort of vibe and then reading Atticus Lish's preparation for the next life for the same kind of thing. So, um, so that was that semester. This semester we're doing, I'm doing a novella class that has a uh, theory for us, like medium long form. And then I think next semester they want me to do a craft class. So I'm gonna do one. I'm just talking out of my beak right now. But, um, I think it's gonna be called liminality and it'll, it'll probably draw from some of the stuff from our class. But you know, that's the nice thing about Sarah Lawrence is they let you just, they've, they've let me make something up and follow through and, and uh, yeah. But I'm glad, you, I'm glad you felt that way about that class. Yeah, I um, I wouldn't I wouldn't quite know how to communicate it as well as you did, but I I, I do think that that you had the right you have the right audience at that particular college for that too. Yes, because you right? uh, you know I, I I think I've stayed in touch with maybe three or four people, and uh, they all at one point remember uh, remember it that's the one thing that stuck with them was probably that class. That's fantastic. Um, it's yeah. really nice to hear. And, 
I, I didn't know that you were also exploring cinema. That's interesting too, because I've been reading these uh, philosopher on film series. It's, these yeah. are these little books, like ones about Mulholland Drive, and it's just a collection of philosophy essays rooted in exploring Mulholland Drive or oh, that's Eternal fantastic. Sunshine. Yeah, yeah, uh, and, yeah. Uh, I got really, I really, you know, I used to be really heavily into film, and um, and then I sort of fell off that wagon for a while. And then this class forced me to jump back on it. But I was reading a lot, a lot of um, Samondan and uh, Deleuze, Guattari. Uh, I got turned on to, have you ever heard of Giorgio uh, Agamben? No. Agamben, he's an Italian contemporary philosopher. He's alive. He's, you know, uh, there's just, I, it, it forced me to sort of go, you know, beyond what I knew and uh, which is not that, hard to do <laughs> but I had to push and um and i just discovered all sorts of new stuff and now i'm using that in we were looking at brisson for instance and ozu and and then we'd move on to like a contemporary film um you know like uh is it martha marcy may do you know this one it's a phenomenal film i can't mm. and i never get the title right it's it's uh hold on a sec and I'll leave, I'm going to link to the all of this content in the description for everybody listening. Oh, good. Yeah, because um, Create, to keep it, the discourse it, going. The, the the title ugh, is terrible because it, it deserves it deserves it deserves to be, to be spoken. It does exactly, <laughs> and I can't get Zoom to get me out of full screen for some reason. There, there we go. Hold on a sec. Um. So, uh, hold on a sec. Martha, Martha, Marcy, May, uh, Martha, Marcy, May, Marlene. And, uh, you know, so we're looking at that via like neural connections and, and uh, it was just every, every week was a new like way of just sort of looking at how this stuff works that uh, totally relates because, you know, cinema theory and it's all narrative, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's all connected in a sense. I mean, prose is going to be different. The delivery system is different, certainly. But uh, you know, so we were looking at certain things via like the topology of the psyche, the the Jungian notion of like what the psyche is composed of, and so the body is in a sense one thing, and then the ego is maybe the text. Uh, I, th it was just so fun, and again, that's that's something that Sarah Lawrence lets me just muck around with. I don't have to worry about um, you know, every class is kind of like a lab that way. That's an interesting way to break it down too. Like now I'm thinking about where would the ego lie? And... Well, that's the thing. So check, so check, so think about this. So this is what I, so, so the topology of the psyche suggests that you have uh, four components. The psyche is composed of four things. The body is part of it. And that was where he broke from Freud uh, among many other ways. So Jung felt that the body was absolutely part of our psychic rigging because think about somatic responses, you know, if we're stressed out, we can get sick. Um, and so he's like, well, how can you how can you leave the body out of any discussion of psychology? Because it's obviously causing, it's obviously a part of this. So there's the body, the uh, ego or conscious mind. Um, there's the unconscious, which he called the um, universal unconscious, I think. And then there's the collective unconscious, which is more like archetypes and things like that. But what's interesting, oh, another class I taught, which is where I learned all this, was probably right after that unplot class that I taught. It was um, it's called Fable Surrealism Madness. And it was a way of looking at um, sort of the schizophrenic tendency, tendencies of a text. And uh, so we took fairy tales and we broke them down to like what about them was um, uh, what was their psychic framework in a sense? And so we read theory about it and everything else. And so that's where I learned about, we, we had to get into Jung because Jung is where you turn to when you want to analyze fairy tales. So um, anyway, there's a, every, every class I feel like I get out of it more than the students do. <laughs> and then, I, then it propagates some other class to follow. <clears throat> it's all the more reason to do it. I think the best yeah. teachers get get knowledge out of what they're doing because um, you're not the first person to tell me that that uh, uh, you have another colleague there also named David um, who 
says the same thing that he gets he gets more from his students than he's capable of delivering. <laughs> I, I agree with that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I think that the whole, I think the best, the best education I, I get going all the way back to maybe elementary school was always the classes where the teachers were having more of a dialogue and an exploration than an actual lesson, you know? Right. Well, the classes I'm teaching are always so off the cuff that I'm like, I'm white knuckling it up to the moment I show up in the room. <laughs> you know, I get in there, I'm feeding off of pure adrenaline because I, I, I have no idea what's going to come out of the things that I sort of stuffed my head full of all week. Um, and so uh, I might have 30 pages of notes and I won't even look at them because I'm so like running off of different synapses, but it's only because of that pressure, you know, it's yeah. not a rote thing. It's not something where it's let's turn to page 36 and read the following together, you know? Um, and I know there are some classes where that's, that's what you have to do. It's, the school requires it of you, let's say. Yeah. Um, or maybe the, the class itself, you know, you can't get all loosey goosey teaching, certain um certain um academic ideas you have to stick to the ideas themselves you know so i think that's what's great about an mfa um generally speaking is you re you're allowed to sort of stray it makes it a really um fertile environment because otherwise i don't know if i'd be able to teach really i don't i don't think i can do a, a straight class very easily yeah I, I i can barely sit through them i definitely wouldn't be able to do that either um yeah. You know, I, I saw you read once. I want to, I want to tell the people about this. So uh -oh. um, you brought in, I don't know if it was a stack of cards or if it was a fold, foldable thing, but you brought in a modular story based on how much time you'd be given. And do you remember this? Like you said, oh, no, if, I, if I have 15 minutes, then I have a 15 minute version. Or if I have a five minute, then I can just use this version. <laughs> Well, you know what's funny? Yes, I, I do remember that. I got a funny story about that. First of all, that it ended up in the Harvard Review, and they have just yesterday posted it online. It was in a print edition that I thought nobody was going to read, and and I was excited to be in it, you know. But then yesterday on Twitter, I go to Twitter and I see I see a sentence that looks really weirdly familiar, and I'm like, wait a minute. And then I see it's my name, and they're like, we've just posted David Ryan's story. It's called Warp and Weft, and uh, so right now there's a sort of uh, you know, with the three people who follow me, <laughs> it's, it's like this. Uh, so that's out. And yeah, so what I wanted to do with that was, and there's an interesting story about this because I wanted to write a story because I was doing all these readings and a certain reading might, uh, they might say, well, we need you to read for only five minutes. And then they might, another reading might say, well, 20 minutes would be great or 25 minutes. And then what I found was I was using up all my stories and I knew that I might end up with the same audience or a similar audience. And so I was like, I'm going to write a story that should hold up together no matter how many pieces I unplug from it or plug back into it. And so um, there was a method to it that's, that I've now just turned into sort of the method I use for all my writing in a way, but, um, but that's a whole other thing. So there was the, there were a few, there were maybe three, five minute stories. And there were a couple 10 minute. And then there was one that was maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And the idea was that I could read two of them and it would feel like they were connected, but I could read one of them and it would feel connected. Or I could read four of them, or I could read the entire thing and you'd feel it, you'd, you'd, you'd hear an entire trajectory that moved through it. So Harvard Review contacted me uh, and said, we really like this, but it's too long. We really, really would like it to be punchier. And I'm like, you know, there was no, there was no way for me to edit it, to to make it any tighter. In fact, I sent it to a friend, another editor I really admire, a writer and an editor I really admire, and he was like, "There's ten words I can pull out of this. I don't, there's nothing, there's nothing to take out of it." So it turns out there was this one section. It was my favorite section, and I was like, "What if I just unplug this? Because that's the thing's meant to be, you know." and send them the rest of it. But then I take the one that I unplugged and I send it somewhere else. And so I unplugged it and I sent the version then to the Harvard Review and I said, what do you think about this? And I didn't even bother waiting to hear and I took the thing I unplugged and I sent it to the Three Penny Review. And two days later, Three Penny Review wrote back and said, we want it. 
And I'm like, yeah. And then the Harvard Review wrote, Harvard Review wrote back and said, perfect. I'm like, oh my God, this could, I mean, it was one of those like perfect moments that could not happen. Uh, probably will never happen again. But that story, the one that has, the one that's unplugged, but has all the others, um, it forms a continuum from the first piece to the last. So it actually has a trajectory. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's up at the Harvard Review's website right now. Nice. So. I'll link to that. So you yeah. have something to push. That's great. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, oh, that, I mean, you, of course, always have this book, Animals in Motion. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, what, ha, have you thought about what a lot of these um, these editors are responding to over the years when, when you, you send these and, you, and you're getting all this positive feedback, whether it requires edits or not, you've got a lot of positive, positive feedback over the years. I'd be curious to what it, what it is they're responding to. Um, I didn't have the, the gonads to ask the editor about my story. Like, what is it about yeah. the story? Uh, but, um, I'd imagine that's got to be something that you think about. What is it that you know, you're doing? It's been, it's been, um, my wife is uh, reminding me pretty regularly about all sorts of ways of being positive. Um, because, you know, just right now, everything, things are so much looking to improve now. I'm so, life in general feels so much more promising now. But I'm still sort of, I feel like we've all been hammered for a few years with, um, you know, stress and depression and um i sometimes forget about because i get rejected a lot i send a lot of stuff out and it gets rejected and oftentimes it'll get rejected a bunch of times and then the place that takes it is is actually the best place like the three penny review is a dream press i can't even believe that they took a piece and they'd rejected me a bunch of times and it was like yeah. the thing about the three penny review was i was like well you know i'll send it and maybe even by the time I hear back from the Harvard Review, they'll have rejected it. <laughs> you know? So if I need to plug it back into the Harvard Review piece, at least I'll have tried. So I was really playing a little fast and loose with like the situation <laughs> itself. Um, but but the, the thing that I find really baffling is just how many times something can get rejected and then get picked up somewhere else. Um, and I think it's just a matter of, uh, you know, I edit a literary magazine too, and we have screeners, and they're very um, thoughtful. Um, they're often young, and I think there's a kind of um, idea about what's good uh, that that changes with your age. It changes with uh, as you as you change. You change, you know. And so I sometimes see in literary magazines stuff that feels really, um, I'll just say it, facile. Uh, but I think that's that's sometimes the voice of the magazine, and it's not facile. It's just my own tastes are different than that. Um, but I get rejected a lot. Uh, I I keep telling my wife I'm going to write something um, much different from my normal ways, and then I I I don't know how to do that, so I just keep going. But I do think that um, to get more to an answer, uh, I just don't think you can. You can know, you know. I had a piece. The main editor of a of a magazine wrote to me and said, "I love this story, but I couldn't get my staff to uh, go along with it." And um, it's, you know, I have to. It's a it's a collective thing here, and so I can't just say I want it. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it got rejected. So I don't know. Yeah, I, don't I remember know. that story. And that was a really like an honest and sort of bittersweet form of feedback yeah yeah it was it was a more of a lament because this person you know this person was like he's actually a, a he was a famous poet it turns out um and uh and and really like super well educated and everything else but it so happens that they let the interns the, the interns at the press have a final say and so there's this really strange screening process where once a sort of pool of manuscripts are chosen, then it kind of goes to this place that where where like an average reader might be, you know, in a sense. Um, so it didn't it didn't work there. I'm still sending that piece out bitterly <laughs> because it felt so close. Like it felt like it came so close. 
Um, so I don't know. And I, and I feel sometimes like I have to remind myself that I've been very fortunate and that, um, uh, you, you know, if you, if you look at social media, you get a sense that there's just this one thing that everyone's interested in. And it's, it's sometimes easy to really fall into a kind of despair about how that isn't you. Um, I think one of the nice things about the internet, um, I don't think that's a nice thing about it, but I think one of the nice things about it is there are a lot of magazines now that are able to pop up and, and start publishing stuff. And some of them are even really good. Yeah. And um, that means that you just look for the kind of voice that you like and see if they'll take your stuff. Um, Cause I have, I don't have a clue how it works. And I, sh and I feel like I should at this point, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, the magazine that published my story was, was, was an online thing, I think. And yeah. um, they broke their page count rule for me. They're That's like, this is 20 pages. We only do up to 12, but we'll break right. it for you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Is wonderful. Well, that says a lot about the strength of the writing, you know? Yeah. Um, oh, I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, the other thing is, <clears throat> I think because I edit a literary magazine, I also see the slush pile and I see the stuff, see what everyone is writing all the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, <clears throat> it's, it's why I tell students like they should all get a job as a screener, even if it's just for a few months for a literary journal, there's lots of those possibilities, a reader, a reader for the magazine, because you start to really see all that's coming in all the time. And you kind of learn what to maybe avoid in your own stuff. You see it in your own stuff. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, um, I've learned that um, when I was in, I went back to school later in life. So I did my undergrad in my mid thirties. And the first thing I did was I applied year after year to their literary journal at this at the college and eventually in the last year i got in or second to last year and um that was an eye-opening experience because uh, i was reading stuff that i'm like how are how how is this college level and i and i just kind of realized one what i was up against in terms of the good stuff and right. what i needed to stop doing in terms of the bad stuff or bad i don't use bad as in bad but like just I don't have another word to replace it with right now, but um, not to develop stuff. Maybe <laughs> yeah, uh, right. that's the Under best me. way to describe it. Um, but um, the other thing to in this, because I also do films, which is which is why I responded to your whole cinema class. Right. But um, when I was, I, I used to advise film festivals on their indie submissions because a lot of them don't have the eye for independent or art house cinema. And um, just seeing how many, how, how much content out there isn't, it's not original, not from the heart. And, and everybody, will, just based on the technical prowess, could do better. And I, I suppose that, could, that feedback could also be applied to writing. Everybody yeah. had the technical ability, but they weren't yielding it, wielding it in a way that... Uh, would make them stand out yeah and that's that's the uh that's the thing i see most often with the pieces where you're like this is technically proficient this is technically good this person and a lot of times those people will have a bio that is they'll have published in a lot of magazines and stuff but um often it's it's really boring it there's nothing that's shocking i'd much rather have a i'd much rather read a, a technically flawed piece or a piece that actually flouts the law entirely and just does something so mind-blowingly strange that i'm i'm glued to it um it's about being interesting you know and i think i think that's where the stuff that i really am drawn to as a reader it's it's is it gonna is it gonna do something to me that nothing else has done uh before which isn't that easy with storytelling because you know there's only so many different things you can say so oftentimes it's how you do it how you actually yeah. say it matters well you know what i'm doing what i or what i did and what i'm currently doing because this film has taken so many years to make but i'm all, i'm almost done editing this film and what i decided to do with this film you know it's about an artist who's trying to get work but he's too artsy for any company to actually hire him right. <laughs> which is like really relatable um <laughs> and so i decided well he doesn't apply to jobs with a computer instead a black hole opens up in his apartment and pieces of his soul get put in this is another like the soul thing is like <laughs> a piece of his soul gets put in 
and over time the black hole becomes sentient and takes over his life oh, <laughs> or wow. his space and yeah. kind of grows like a cancer in his apartment oh my and, god and um and so like it's just like okay there's a thousand movies out there where somebody's applying to to jobs and they're using a computer or they're typing up their resume depending on how old the movie is right and nobody's ever thought to actually show it for what it really is a soul sucking black hole <laughs> <laughs> just just show it for what it is. Yeah. Um, and, and I wish I saw that that level of creativity a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, I agree. <laughs> and I, I think it's interesting, too, because, you know, I've been teaching speculative classes every once in a while when, when at Sarah Lawrence when they need somebody to do that. And I'm not a big, um, I wouldn't say that I'm a big speculative fiction reader. Um, it's just not, I didn't grow up reading it. I, I haven't really found it that compelling for the most part. On the other hand, some of my favorite stuff would probably fall under that that term, um, and so it's a I'm a hard sell on some levels, but then I'll then I'll have to admit that there are certain things that are just my most soulful favorite things that happen to be, you know, like Tarkovsky's Solar Solaris. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I don't know how anyone can see that movie and not be completely changed. Um, so so I can't I can't quite knock it. Uh, that way but i do find that there's a there's this strange conf, conf, conformity in things that purport to challenge reality uh that that i that i try to shake out of my students too when i'm teaching so it doesn't even matter whether it's uh grounded in realism or trying to sort of subvert realism it can be boring you're either interesting or boring basically right so um, that's been something that's been an interesting thing to notice is that some of the stuff that I'm most interested in nowadays is um, I, I've been really drawn to this idea of irrealism. Do you know about the about the irrealists? Can you spell it? It's I R R E A L I S M. Irrealism. School me. School me. Well, to the extent that I <laughs> am capable, I don't know, but I, I do think that there's a uh, Mary Capo, uh, Capo Negro and. Um, uh, Amor McBride, the Irish writer. There's, um, oh God, what's her name? She's she's wonderful. You know, if you if you go to the White Review, the British magazine, uh, the White Review, you'll see quite a bit of it. And in a sense, it's this it's it's a kind of realism that's even more real because it's grounded in um, just how flexible our unconscious is. If you think of, you know, Lacan recur referred to what he called the real as this thing that we don't have access to because it's absolutely batshit crazy. And um, it, it is so unreal in a sense that it's real because we spend our entire lives trying to put up a symbolic order, these bricks of reality around us just to keep the real out. Oh, um, yeah. Lacan was schooled in, um, you know, the French... Uh, psychiatrists of his day were trained in the asylum so-called asylums in the trench i mean in, in the the saddest cases of mental illness whereas the austrian model was more of an armchair like you know tell me about your childhood it was it was a much more polite uh so lacan's notion of what is real is in fact what we spend our entire lives trying to keep from ever having to face because it is so terrifying um and so the irrealists let that leak out a little bit. And so there's, um, uh, is it, hold on, I'm gonna, uh, Claire Louise Bennett is uh, a writer. She wrote a, a novel called Pond. Uh, and I, I think of her, I don't know if she would think of herself as this, but I think she's sort of part of this whole group. But Mary Caponegro, who teaches at Bard, um, uh, um, there's a, there's a whole bunch of them, I'm, and of course, I've, I can't think of any of them right now. But it's it's this idea that at any moment, the reality could split off into some sort of parallel reality that's equally valid, but the writer's letting that happen. And so there's this sense of a psychic uh, strangeness that never leaves the realm of the real, because in fact, um, we're capable of splitting off into different sort of psychic states uh, at any given moment. And so in a sense, it's more real than realism.
because it's allowing for the, the sort of um, seemingly unstructured leaks of the unconscious into the conscious realm. That's, I don't know that anyone who, I don't know that anyone that somebody calls an irrealist would say that they are an irrealist. I have no idea. Um, and I don't, also don't know that that's what they would use to explain themselves. I'll say that that's how I would explain what I've been writing lately. Um, I mean, maybe I'm an irrealist. I, I suppose I'm probably mostly an irrealist at this point in that in that respect. Um, there's no, there are no rules um, when you really think about how flexible our sanity is, like how how capable our sanity is of how vulnerable we are at any given moment, um, just seeing things that aren't there or to believing things that aren't true. Yeah. Um, We've and seen that's, that this past year. Exactly, right? And, you know, and there's, there's this whole, like, um, it's so funny because now I'm, I have students who use the term um, uh, gaslighting. It's, that's just become this common term where, you know, 10 years ago, people knew that there was a film called Gaslight and that the, it was referring to that and there was a sort of but i think the trump era and a great deal of um the past 20 years of of various republican um not to get too political here but gaslighting has turned into just a, a trope that everyone knows now because it has been so prevalent yeah. um so yeah i think we're all a little shattered from all of that so so the way you see entire movements on twitter move toward this this concept of that somebody referred to it as the death, Twitter's just the death drive, basically. It's a constant set of impulses that are driving towards some sort of terminus. And that's why we feel so anxious when we when we go there, because it's all death in yeah. a sense, a psychic sense. Yeah, it's hard not to it's hard not to go there, and then it's hard not to get political and enraged when you're there. Exactly, and right? So it it, it almost pull, it pulls out all of the the shit that we're trying to deny is within us <laughs> all the life that we want to have right mm. all the like if you have thanatos if you have the god of death uh, there's eros which is life and 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 i think that's what art does is it balances the two it allows for that sort of space where you know whereas social media is all that sort of um that it's this hyperventilating it's this it's too much oxygen basically in a sense yeah um, no, that's a great way to think about it. And um, do you ever do you ever read about or I mean, you can also just watch videos about it, which are equally as fascinating because they have 3D models now. But um, I've been obsessed with the fourth dimension as of late and the idea of the fourth dimension. Do you ever do you ever read about that? You know, I um, I don't know enough about it to even pretend that I know anything about it, but I am interested in all that stuff. I remember reading a book on string theory a long time ago. It was like a bestseller and I can't remember even what it was. And I was fascinated with, with just th these ideas that are floating around out there. Um, and I do, I do, I actually have a novel where I deal with the idea of, uh, I guess is that, would you call it the multiverse where, where at every single moment there's an infinite set of possibilities that are also happening at that same time. And essentially we step from one to another um, and then a new, uh, a, a new life happens whenever we step from one line to another, but all yeah. the while, every possibility is happening simultaneously. Um, yeah, that, that comes out of, um, the double slit experiment where okay. like they, they shoot, they'll shoot like a particle at two slits. Yeah. And when it's not observed over time, um, uh, a pattern forms on a back wall that indicates it's functioning like a wave as if they pushed water through it and all the ripples, you know, interact with one another. Yeah. And they put a measuring device in to see which slit it actually went through because previously it was behaving like it went through both, but it's only one particle. So how's it going through both? Oh my God. So when they put the measuring device in, its behavior changes and it chooses one. And then over time, it's only one or the other. And so only two, two, marks appear on the back wall or something like that and yeah. so the act of observing changes it from being changes the particle from being all options to just being one wow <laughs> yeah so so it's the limitation of the of our uh, our capacity to observe that 
determines our limits of understanding what's possible. It, when you're not looking is when actually the, the, the thing is really behaving as it, as it is. Yeah, and that's called, um, oh, my, 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 my terminology is slipping. Um, it's, it'll come to me, but the, when, it, when it's observed, when it's not observed, it's functioning like a wave. And then when it's observed, it collapses what they call the wave function. And then it chooses a state to exist in, but it's choosing it. It's it's wow. so weird, and it's almost like oh, he's watching me. <laughs> yeah, I better be paying a certain way. Yeah, oh, that's, that's exactly what I think of. But oh my god! The, but the fourth dimension is even like that. So the fourth dimension is a weird thing where, like, from a mathematical standpoint, yeah. they can work with it, but when we try to think about it, we can't comprehend it. Right, and there's this one idea that if we were able to look at humanity from the fourth dimension, we wouldn't look like how we look. We would look like snakes where our tail end is our fetus. And then our, our head is like, however old we end up being before we die. Oh my God. The way the snake would wrap around the environment would dictate, would be dictated by your travels throughout your life. So I guess I would, wrap around various parts of Maine and then you would see the snake kind of extending over to Vancouver for a little bit and then to New York and then wrapping around Manhattan many, many, many times because I walked around right. Manhattan a lot. And yeah. so you would see that my snake body like wrapping around buildings and stuff. Oh, that's like, It's an interesting concept because it takes yeah. out the progression of time and just makes it all like one right. static frame. That's insane. I know. It's and, just... yet, and yet it's, it's probably far more real than, than we'll ever understand, you know, consciously at least. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think about this stuff a lot lately because I'm trying to develop something derived from it. And it's, it's the hardest thought challenge I've had yeah. in a while. Well, you know, there's that example. And this was in the string theory book that I read of the flatworm. And the flatworm only sees two dimensions because the flatworm is flat and its eyes are sticking straight up. And so it actually does not see anything with dimensionality. Yeah. And so that's used as, as, as an example to show how we can't break through three dimensions because it's just simply not possible for us to, to experience it in any real sense. But much the same way, the flatworm will lie there and you can stand around the flatworm and go, well, no, this is in three dimensions. And the flatworm, if they could talk, would say, well, no, it isn't. That's impossible, you know? Um, yeah, oh, yeah. That's me. that's actually what they based a lot of the these ideas off of. Is if you were living in like a two dimensional space and an orb came through your space, you would just see a circle appear and disappear. Wow. Or if a fourth dimension uh, shape came through our space, we would just see it appear and vanish. We wouldn't see how it came through or its full shape. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, I, I feel like that's getting in a way at the narrative of these irrealists that I was talking about, where there's a, there's a sort of, um, and it's very different because they're not doing stuff that's that like completely hard to process in language, say. Um, but in language, they are processing sort of uh, multiplicities, let's say, or things that can happen. Claire Louise Bennett has a piece in the White Review in a print edition called The Russian Man. And uh, it's just brilliant, but it moves, it, it kind of reads like someone who, and I'm not saying that this is, that she did, but it's like somebody on acid and just really literally transcribing or somebody who smoked a lot of the, a really good pot, let's say, and they're just really high and they're just transcribing what they're seeing. And it, it doesn't have that wacky, you know, angle to it, it's very real. Um, but stuff is happening and traveling through basically a grocery store that uh, I, I don't think I've ever read that way before. So in a sense, I think there is a the, 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 this, this sense of an other dimension to prose and to the way narrative can operate is sort of what's happening these days, as opposed to a pure speculative approach, which is, you know, space opera or whatever, like there's a yeah. spaceship or there's, there's a, a fantasy framework around it, which I often find is the most cliche stuff. That... Well, it's also just, um, I don't think it makes some of these ideas as accessible because you, there's a certain expectation that comes with it. And so, right. I mean, I took a speculative class in my MFA and some of it was good. Like I really loved we, 
and I read Solaris for the second time. Right. Um, I don't know if you read We. We's a weird oh. book, so, but um, it's a Russian book, and um, it's it's I won't get into it, but um, most of it was just not. It wasn't quite there. Like there were some interesting ideas that could be explored, but I think they would have been better explored in a different context. I think part of the problem for me has always been that sometimes the concept or the this so-called world building takes precedence over just the soul of human interest in the story. And so, and then there's also, you know, with certain genre, you, you, you do stick to, if you write a Western, you probably need to have certain things that happen in the Western, you know, uh, the Unforgiven is such a great film for for that reason. Is it's 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 capturing all the tropes of the Western, and it's 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 got a fidelity to it. And you can watch that movie and be completely electrified because the Eastwood's direction and the acting is just so good in it. Um, but that genre requires a certain fidelity to it. Where you see uh, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which thwarts it, you know, where Altman takes the Western and inverts it. And so instead of the cowboy riding off into the sunset at the end, he's dying in a snowstorm, a blizzard spinning around him. Um, and so there's a literal uh, transposition uh, and, and opposition to the trope. But what, I'm, what I find more often the case is that the, the writer's trying to stay true to something that the form appears to dictate, you know, and you can only fill that form so many different ways before it just gets really boring. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think they're good. They're good templates to start with, but eventually people have to do, have to kind of reinvent how, reinvent it all, actually. And that's where the stuff then gets really interesting. You know, that's where Solaris, for instance, is just to keep going back to that. Um, it's just such an interesting experiment because he's getting into Lacanian ideas of the other and, and uh, just some really heavy, heavy stuff. Uh, so it is conceptual, it is heady, but uh, it's also sort of startling in its own way that I, I, I think is really interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, flashing back. Hmm. We, I, 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 I would recommend we for you. I think you could really unpack that. This is yeah. um, post, I don't know if it's post-apocalyptic, it's been a while, but it's this yeah. weird society of people who have like AI writing all their poetry for them the, or all their art and it's yeah. totally shit. <laughs> and, um, but they, in a Brazil, Brazil kind of way, they think that they're the best and all of their values are intact. And uh, it's, it's it, it, the, the author ended up, he he was one of the few creative people who uh, got out of S Soviet Russia alive. <laughs> he basically wrote a letter to Stalin. Of uh, the legend has it, he wrote a letter to Stalin. like, "Hey, can I just leave rather than be killed?" <laughs> and so he's like, "Sure," <laughs> because he got Stalin on a good day. <laughs> oh my god! And you have to, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh my god! Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it's my called friend Weed. George, my friend George was in Cuba when uh, Castro took over, and Castro was saying at the time, you know, anyone can leave whenever you want. We're not here to uh, to keep anyone. And so George is George was a little he was a little boy at the time, and so his dad and mom filed the paperwork and said, well, then fine, we want we want to get the hell out of here, and they um, seized their house, and then processed the paperwork for two years. So they were homeless for two years yeah. uh, um, and eventually did were able to come to the States. But what's interesting is George's dad had a Santeria booth. Uh, so they moved to Florida at first and he had a Santa, he had a booth that he would visit and pray to um, cursing Castro every single night, like with every night, the rest of his life uh, with candles and everything and voodoo. Uh, so. Yeah, that, um, using administrative practices to torture people is one of the cruelest things. Yeah. Yeah. Two years. Yeah. A, that's the kind of shit that gets under, under my skin. I could go right. off Twitter all day about that. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, well, um, this is, uh, this, this discussion is, is making me want to go back to school again. So I appreciate ah! that. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, I'll wrap this up soon. I promise. Um, oh, that's okay. Is uh, 
have you been do you feel like you've been productive this past year i've been um unusually productive i i i have um i'm finishing a revision of a novel uh over last summer i basically wrote it and um over this i mean literally this past summer the covid summer and into the winter um so i've been working on it about 10 months now it was a product of a lot of notes and thinking about stuff i don't outline so it wasn't like that but in terms of just thinking about the ideas of it it was it was longer than that but in eight months i basically it's a 400 page novel and i'm finishing the last um 100 pages i'm in revision of those I have an idea for a novella that i'm i can't wait to start writing um and i think I, well and then i like 30 stories i I've, I've had since animals in motion i've i think i've got like a couple of dozen stories that are done and been published in, in that yeah i was looking and at I, your website it's just it's it's been a lot of and, stuff. and if you look at the rush of the past couple of years it's been kind of nuts and i and that's i'm, I'm thrilled about that but a lot of that has been uh i think desperation i think um you know i get up early in the morning and and for four years the news was so bad every day that it was this couple of hours in the morning where it was still dark out. You know, I get up like at five in the morning. I got up at three today. Um, but that's insomnia, not, not <laughs> discipline. It was just more like, oh, fuck it. I got to get up because I'm not going to sleep again. But, um, you know, to be honest, it was the one time of the day where I felt like I had some control over fate. And I think that's the thing about art for me. And it's just, you know, people people were saying that they're really struggling to create anything because things were so lousy the past few years. And of course, with COVID, it's it's been even stranger and more stressful. But I, I personally found it was saving me because it was the, you know, the the idea is that we're the last great anim, um, animism doesn't exist anymore, but in art, like we're the last manipulators of the spirit within an object. Um, and Freud argued that that's all wish fulfillment, that artists make art because it's the one chance where they can have all of their wishes fulfilled. You create something, you got to dictate the terms, right? Yeah. And oftentimes in our lives, there's very little else that allows us to do that. And so um, and that's kind of a pointy headed way of explaining that I've had a really good couple of years. And I think a lot of it was simply because I just needed to feel like I had some control over something. Yeah, it was a it, response to the world exactly and I, I feel the same way uh, and honestly the worse it got the more productive I got precisely uh, that's exactly me yeah yeah um, and I uh, you you put it so so gently I whereas I would explain it to people as um, a protest against so whenever things got worse I hunkered down and that's as soon exactly. as New York locked down I was I peaked pro at my productivity and yeah. It it really for me was a protest, but I also think you hit on, you hit on it a, a little more. It's a little more accessible the way you hit on it, where um, it's about finding some semblance of control in a world you have no control over whatsoever. Exactly, and I have the added uh, concern of a of a, a nine year old daughter. She's going to be ten pretty soon. I think you oh. know how much I love my daughter and talk about her all the time. But but I also have this. Um, having now a kid my mortality is nailed to me i mean i mean every single moment matters in a way that i never would i never really understood before and that's me some people have different everyone has a different experience with this world of having kids and and marriage and whatever um but for me it's been uh i guess a bracing experience because i'm so i feel very lucky and i'm so happy to have this kid um and i want to i want to have something to show her you know uh she's written a 180 page novel she's nine and she's working on another one it's 30 pages and it's the funniest thing i'll be up in the morning and she'll come downstairs and you know i'm st i'm typing away and she'll come down and she'll like i'm gonna work on my novel and she'll sit down and she's actually an excellent typist you know <laughs> She doesn't have typos. She she she's all over the place. And I look at her and she's like going and she's typing and she's literally writing these, and and it is wish fulfillment again. It's this idea of she's been in lockdown, she's had a terrible time of it, 
And so she's writing stories about traveling to Paris and, and London and adventures. And it's just really, it's just really good. So part of my desperation too, in these mornings when I'm writing is what, where is my legacy? You know, what am I going to have for her? And I'm, it's not going to be money. I wish, I wish that were the case, but it's not going to be, you know, but what can I do that might make her proud of me? Uh, yeah. And, and, and not forget me, you know, I was in a rock band when I was in my twenties and the whole time. And I was, and I was, that was fun, you know, and I, and I look back on it now, I, I hated it at the time because it was a lot of traveling and I, it was nice people. I like, I loved the people I was with, but it was just a very strangely rigorous life that wasn't for me. Um, but my daughter now listens to those records and she can sing along with the songs. And I remember driving her to school uh, like a year ago and this band I was in was called Fuzzy. One of the bands was called Fuzzy and it has two female vocalists who also played guitar and bass and, uh, and then two guys in the rhythm section, bass and drums. And uh, the songs are really great, great pop, you know, and my daughter was singing along with my friend, uh, Chris Toppin, who's one of the, one of the women who sings in the band. And I realized 30 years have passed. And the only reason I was in that band was for this moment in the car. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I was like, Oh my fucking God, like this is why I wanted to be a drummer. And I could have never known that back then. So, yeah. <laughs> so I feel this, this richness in life that, um, it's funny. I, I discovered it so late and, and it, it, everything feels so short and uh, temporary now. And so 400 page novel, I can't wait to get working on the next one because I want to have this thing together. I want to hear her singing. I want to, I want to know that someday she's going to read these, you know? Yeah. I, I know that feeling really, really well. And I just, as a curiosity, has she found you in any music videos yet? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I'll talk <laughs> okay. There's there's one there's one with me on the Tonight Show and she she uh, it's really funny because I'm wearing these enormous um, really tight orange bell bottoms corduroy bell bottoms and a satin shirt and you know I just look really it's 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 awesome like it's it's just it's pretty, it's, I was at an age where you could get away with anything you know um, and there there are other videos that she likes she at her school in art class they let them play music and she'll put on stuff that we listen to at home and sometimes she'll put on um, fuzzy or the lemon heads or whatever. But I, you know, I, 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 for all, for all the, the reasons I thought I was playing back then, I never would have imagined that someday I'd be looking back on it all this way, you know? Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, um, one of the projects I did over the pandemic is I dug up all of my old stuff from way back when I was still a teenager. Yeah. And it just kind of hit me the purpose of all that was just to do it and archive it and only find it again when I knew better, when yeah. I knew that that wasn't, that wasn't what it was. And I don't know, it's just like, there's this weird thing where you realize the purpose of something years after. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That, that, that kind of discovery is, it's, it's, it's so validates how uncertain our lives are at any given moment. It's, it's like a positive version of that uncertainty. It's like a positive reinforcement of just the magic of chance in our lives. When you find something that isn't chance, you by chance find something that you had done and see that there is a law of chance to even that rediscovery. It's, it's uh, yeah. I totally, yeah, that feeling is amazing. That's good. That's, I like where this episode went. Um, <laughs> would you, do you have like a, a, a bio headshot you could send me? Yeah, I do. I, I, it's, it's kind of dark. It looks, it looks really um, kind of goofy and dark, but it, but it's, it's, uh, I do. Yes. I can absolutely email right, you. Cool. Um, and uh, I just use it as a bumper so people will click. Um, well, they may, they may look at it and, and flee. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> uh, it, it looks better than my logo, which is the other option, um, which is just me kind of in a purple haze. But um, no, well, I thought this. Decide, you know, yeah, yeah. You can decide if it's better. <laughs> I think people click on it. You had a you had a really huge almost cult-like following on campus. So you'll have people looking looking to hear you talk again, I think. 
That's great. Yeah. And, and you know, it's funny because uh, Sarah Lawrence, I'm, you know, I'm guest faculty sort of for, hopefully for life. If, 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 you know, hopefully they keep asking me back. Um, um, but it's been, it's been such a surprising thing because I hadn't, I've only taught for a few years. Like I had, I did other things all my life and my friends were all getting out of an MFA program and starting to teach or getting out of an MA or PhD and teach. And that was never what I was doing. It isn't something that I, I didn't want to do. It just wasn't coming my way. And then at Sarah Lawrence, I got this really speaking of chance by chance, this gig teaching. And uh, I was like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. Like, I love this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, it's it's come back in so many different ways now um I'm, I'm actually friends with former students now where they're they're not students anymore we just sort of you know we might have a writing group or or they're texting and we text back and forth it's uh it's it's i feel very blessed with that so yeah hopefully some people will tune into this and yeah, I think they will. Was the yeah. story of how you got into got into this, um, if I remember correctly, or I could be remembering somebody else's story. Uh, Paige found you at a reading in New Hampshire. Was no, no, it? no. So, so it's funny. Uh, Paige and I met in New Hampshire. Paige wasn't working at Sarah Lawrence yet. Um, she and I met at New England College, where there's a low residency program. And I was, um, I, I got in this fellowship or this, yeah, this uh, Elizabeth McGreal. Yates uh, fellowship writer in residence kind of thing. And so I was there on campus and I met Paige and she, when she found out that I taught at Sarah Lawrence, she was like, Oh, you know, I'm applying for a job as associate director. And I'm like, Oh, really? I was really impressed with her obviously as one would be. And I remember contacting Brian Morton and, and emailing him and saying, Hey, I'm, I'm here in New Hampshire with this poet um, named Paige. And she's just incredible. I'm, I'm really impressed. She said she's applied for the job. I just want to let you know, you know, I want to pull her application out and check it out. And he's like, we'll do. The next thing I, I knew she was coming out for an, for an interview and everything else. And I don't, I don't think my recommendation meant anything except that it just had him pull the application and think yeah. about it. Um, it was all pages doing, getting the job, but I, I got the job, you know, Nellie Reifler who teaches at Sarah Lawrence mm -hmm. had a class with her. Yeah. She was pregnant and, uh, uh, with her boy Beckett. And, um, I had never taught before and, she knew that the last three sessions of her workshop, she was probably going to be out because she was, she was really getting late in her term. So she went to the head of the program, Brian at the time and said, um, you know, I'm not going to be able to do these last three sessions, but I know this guy, he's never taught before, but I think he'd probably be really good at this. Would you be willing to give him a shot? And it's, you know, Brian Morton is such a, He's sort of an angel in my life and, and, and so he doesn't know this and now it's going to be on a podcast, but I, I really, I credit him with allowing this to happen and, you know, my whole life changed. So I showed up, I taught the last three sessions and then um, I guess some of the students went to him and said, he, you know, you should ask him back. And uh, that was a starting, that was the start of my teaching career. Basically, I'd never done it before. So uh, yeah, so that's the origin story of that. It was a good story. Yeah. Uh, for fortuitous. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. Um, well, this is this has been a, the episode I, I've been wanting for a long time, and I and again I really appreciate it, and I hope that you come on again at some point. Oh, I'd love to. Yeah. Uh, if you have anything you want to, you know, this this thing on liminality that I'm going to teach. I mean, I'm just making shit up right now, but. <laughs> But uh, I, they have that admitted students day at Sarah Lawrence where they have a sort of a, a, a mini class. And so they've asked me to teach it and they want me to teach the speculative students. And so I'm like, well, OK, but, you know, it's not going to be speculative. It'll be something that's that will be interesting to anyone and, and should be interesting to speculative students, hopefully. Yeah. Um, but it got me off on this whole thing because I have to come up with a class idea for the fall. I so, could see well, your craft, the one I the version I took, I could see that up uh, being part of the speculative uh, program. Easily. There's no reason, right? Right. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's about the imagination. It's about f phenomenology more than any sort of rote genre or method or anything else. It's about, it's about using your understanding how your brain processes memory and stuff like that. Yeah. And I, I've been trying to keep the classes so that like um, Paige now knows that she can have poets 
nonfiction, fiction, speculative. The, the, my classes are open to anyone, and you know, it's not like anyone feels left out. You know, yeah. but this one on liminality that I want to teach, I think, is really exciting, and I'm kind of just formulating some ideas with that. Uh, so if you want to come, if you want me to come back, like in a few months, I I might have a lot of kind of fun stuff to talk about. Yeah, anytime. Right. Okay. Whether whether you have something or not. Okay. okay. <laughs> well, if you if you have a hole in your schedule and you need it filled, let me know, and I'll I'll, I'll drop definitely by. do that. Uh, thank you, David. All right, Eric. Be in touch by email. All right, great man. I'll talk to you later. Bye. Bye bye.